This is Patriot to the Core Podcast, and I am Thad Forster. Thank you for tuning in today. Uh, today's guest is Johnny Spann. Before I get to him, I just want to ask you to please rate the podcast on iTunes or maybe some other uh, form of, I don't know, some other podcaster that you use. Um, but please, uh, you can give it some uh, five stars, and you could write a review if you feel so inclined as well. Uh, this episode also is brought to you by... Um, well, it's brought to you by me, Thad Forster. I don't really have any advertisers or any sponsors. I wish I did. Maybe I could get somebody like, um, you know, Dollar Shave Club or uh, Host Gator. Or I don't know. There's a, there's a ton. Of, there's a lot of good ones out there I wish I could get. So uh, if anybody has any suggestions, <laughs> please let me know for some sponsors. Uh, we'll get into um, the guest now. Johnny Spann is the father of Mike Spann. And Mike Spann was the first death in Afghanistan uh, from the U.S.'s invasion and the war on terror. And so because of that, it's there's been a lot of press on him and several articles written over the years. And Johnny has been on kind of a mission to find out really what happened and to decipher between the truth and uh, fiction and, and maybe learn who he could trust and who he couldn't. And so uh, he actually went to Afghanistan. He met with General Dostum and uh, several other people so it's it's very interesting and um, Johnny and I uh, Johnny is very lives very close to my hometown of Haleyville and so I've never met him but his uh, our parents my parents and he have met and uh, he was very gracious to talk to us today uh, about uh, Mike and his career leading up to his deployment after 9-11 and then life since. So this is part one because we went, uh, we talked quite a bit. And so I split this up. And so you're listening to part one now. But Johnny, why don't you tell us about your son, Mike, you know, and what he was like growing up. I know he played sports in high school and, you know, why he went to Auburn and, you know, and then why he decided to join the military. Well, uh, from the time Mike was, a young man, and I don't remember exactly, you know, the exact year, but, uh, he was, uh, he started, uh, showing that he was always interested in, in military and, uh, real, uh, a history buff for sure. Always wanted to go by the, uh, uh, different places. When we go on vacation, we always had to go by some of the war museums or graveyards and things like that and battles and the civil war stuff. And he he would collect posters, you know, of the Marine Corps, and he had those on his walls and on his ceiling. And uh, we moved probably three or four different houses while Mike was growing up. Uh, I was a builder, and we would you know sell a house that we lived in every now and then. So, but he always took his posters and redid his room when he we got to the house. He was putting them on the walls and then the ceilings and stuff. And uh, Mike was always a, a I uh, considered him to be very patriotic. Uh, he, uh, was the kind of boy that was, uh, could never get enough. He, uh, I can remember going upstairs and opening the door, uh, open the door to his room and him sitting in the floor reading the encyclopedia and, uh, uh, you know, just, uh, really, really like, loved history and, uh, things like that. Uh, he, uh, as Mike got older, uh, in, uh, high school, uh, of course he didn't play a lot of sports, but. He did play football, and uh, uh, when he uh, we started off playing, you know, t-ball and baseball and those kind of things in the younger years, and then he sort of didn't play any for a few years, and then came back and started playing football. Uh, Mike, uh, I'd always carried Michael to the Alabama games, and I was an Alabama fan myself, and I was real surprised when he came to me. Uh, and told me that he was had decided to go to Auburn school. And, uh, you know, I was like, go to Auburn. I, I've never even been to Auburn and I have not been to Auburn. I didn't even know I'd never been down there. So, but he, uh, he had decided for some reason that he wanted to go to Auburn and, uh, Auburn's a good school and I'm, I'm proud Certainly. that he did go there. And, uh, of course, uh, before he, uh, went to, uh, college while he's still in high school, he had, uh, came to me and, and told me that he wanted to uh, get his uh, private pilot's license because he'd always had this thing about he, he wanted to, to fly for the military. And 
of course, I, I agreed, you know, that, so he went to Fayette, which is, you know, 20 miles south of us down here to Mr. Crow uh, was running that airport then. He's a retired Air Force uh, officer. And uh, so he gave Mike his lessons and whatever to for him to get his pilot's license. And I remember uh, it was so important to him. He, he told me that this was during spring training that uh he said, I, I've, I've got to, uh, I've got what he called it now, uh, some kind of a, a training session that he had to uh, go where he's flying by himself doing his solos. And at the same day, uh, that same afternoon, uh, they had football practice. And uh, so I told him, well, go to Coach Hubbard. He was a football coach at that time. I said, go to Coach Hubbard and just tell him, explain to him what you need to do. I'm sure he'll work with you. And so he did. He talked to Coach Hubbard, and Coach Hubbard told him, yeah, that'd be fine. You know, he'd, he'd let him leave and go to his uh, solo uh, practice. So when he came by my office, I told him, I said, no, Mike, do not fly back up to Winfield. Do not go over the football field or anything like that. You know, I said, he was good enough to let you off, uh, you know, to go do your solo training. Uh, so don't agitate him. Well, about 45 minutes later, you know, I hear an airplane. So I go outside my office and look up, and there's a mic. <laughs> and my, my office is about, you know, about a 1,000 feet, I guess, from the football field. And he was flying over the football field. And uh, so then uh, I called Coach Hubbard, and he said, yes, yeah. so we stopped and, and waved at him. You know, <laughs> all the guys really liked it. So it turned out to be a pretty neat thing, you know, that, he was flying up and us making circles over him, and they were all stopped and waving at him and hollering <laughs> at him. Uh, so there was always some kind of excitement in Mike's life. So what is the age uh, limit to to get a private pilot's license? Well, he started training when he was sixteen. Wow! And uh, I think I think he just have to be sixteen. Huh. And he uh, he got his license before he graduated. He already had them when he uh, graduated high school. Uh, but unfortunately, Mike's size uh, re- uh, kept him from uh, getting into any other kind of pilot training. Plus, the fact that he, when he's in high school, his se- uh, not high school, but his uh, college, in his senior year down there, uh, he and uh, a young lady got married. And uh, as a matter of fact, when he was, uh, his daughter, Allison, uh, was born uh, like about a month before he uh, graduated uh, Auburn. Mike was trying to figure out for sure what he wanted to do, and he his degree in criminal justice, so he was, uh, you know, putting in applications for different uh, places, the FBI and the CIA and uh, U.S. Marshals and just, you know, uh, various places. And he, he'd, he'd asked me before he went to college, you know, see, he said he thought about just joining the Marine Corps. And I had some friends that were retired officers in the uh, – uh, military, different branches, and all of us were telling me, you know, said, look, you, you don't need to do that. He needs to go to college, and go if he can, and and get the uh, go in as an officer. And uh, so that's what I told him. I said, well, that's not going to be an option. You got to go to college and get your degree, and and uh, then you can go. Uh, in this case, to uh, Quantico. But as the years went by, he didn't talk about it anymore. And so I thought it sort of out of his mind, especially since he got married and was going to have a child. But he called me one night and said that he uh, had made up his mind what he was going to do and uh, that he was going to join the Marine Corps. And I said, uh, Mike, you know, when you were wanting to join the Marine Corps, it was a different situation. You weren't married. You didn't have a child on the way. So, you know, I, what, what makes you want to do that? He said, well, Dad said, you know, I can always, you know, get uh, join the FBI or work for the FBI or the CIA or any of these other places. But if I don't go be a Marine now, I'll never be able to be a Marine, and I want to serve my country. And, you know, I just, I guess it sort of made shields go up and down my back. But I said, okay, sure, I'll support you. We'll do what we got to do. So he went ahead and uh, joined the Marine Corps and got lined up. So as soon as he was out, I think he uh, he was out of college maybe uh, two or three weeks before he uh, went to Quantico. Uh, for his training there at uh, officer candidate school there at Quantico. And then from uh, from there, he went to uh, uh, Fort Seal uh, for six months, 
for some artillery training and then from Fort Sill on to Okinawa. Spent three years in Okinawa and uh, came back uh, after three years there, came back to North Carolina and stayed there until not, mid-1999 and uh, then decided that it was time for him to make a career change again. And I wasn't expecting that. He called me one night and said that he uh, had decided he wanted to make a career change. And I started questioning him again, well, Mike, why do you want to do this? Because at this time he had two kids. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, you're up, you're going to be a captain, uh, the rank of cat, uh, your rank of captain now, and you're going to be the rank of a major within another two months, two to three months. And, uh, he said, you know, dad said, I've been in like 30 something countries, uh, deployed all over the world. And, uh, I, I feel like the further I go up the ladder, I'm not going to be out in the field as much. I'm not going to be with the men. I'm going to have to be at offices and things like that. And, uh, he said, uh, besides, he said, I just don't feel like I've made, you know, I haven't left any kind of marks. I hadn't done anything to really speak of, you know, just being in Marine Corps. And even though he had been on some deployments where it wasn't like being in war, but he had been down in Africa and Colombia and, uh, he had been all over and, uh, they were doing some different type operations and, uh, after he, uh, you know, gave me the spill about that, of course, he, his mind was made up and he was just asking, I guess, for me to agree and say, yes, you know, I'll help you or do what I need to do. The thing about it was that uh, when he when he left the Marine Corps and went with the CIA, he took a $10,000 a year cut and pay Whoa. Uh, to do that. And But his thinking was that the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, was... He was going to be able to, to go in there and uh, he'd be able to move up and he'd pretty much uh, be hands-on uh, type deal. And the harder he worked, the faster he could move and the more things he could do and, and trying to make difference, I guess, in, in the world. And that's what he had actually told me. Uh, so, uh, again, I, I said, well, you know, if what you decide to do, Mike, I'll support you and help you. So, that's that's what he did. He moved to, uh, he went ahead and took the job with the CIA. And I was actually at one of the memorial services uh, about four or five years ago. We have an annual memorial service at the CIA building at Langley there every year uh, for the stars on the wall. And uh, I met a guy, introduced himself to me, and he told me he was the one that had recruited Mike that he had actually gone down to Camp Lejeune and uh, uh, took Mike's application and re- interviewed him and those kind of things. And he, he was telling me that out of, uh, I don't remember the exact number of applicants, I think it was 30-some-odd applicants that he had, that Mike was the only one he took. And uh, that made me feel good that, you know, Mike had the credentials and uh, was impressive enough that, you know, they took took him in. Oh, yeah. And, uh, of course, he started his deployments uh, uh, then with the CIA. Of course, he only had some training there to do with the CIA also at the farm before. Uh, but Mike had all, for the paramilitary uh, job he had, he had all the military training that he needed for that. It's just the uh, other jobs at the uh, the training at the farm was to prepare him for the, uh, I guess, the secret life. Uh, and the things that you do as a CIA agent that I guess everybody else doesn't really know about. Well, now, I, I feel like I should know this, but what is the farm? I haven't heard that term. Uh, the farm is uh, the CIA agency's uh, training facility in Virginia, and uh, it's set up just for, uh, that's where they every, every CIA agent has to go to there for a six-month training period. Okay. And teaching them, you know, intelligence, how to gather intelligence, how to, uh, I guess, be undetected, how to detect, uh, just, you know, live the life of a, a CIA agent when they're abroad. Okay. And, uh, I, I don't know all the things, you know, they teach them, uh, but I've heard, I've read some of the books and some of the few things that Mike told me. He didn't tell me a lot of uh the details, 
you know, about things he did. He wasn't supposed to. Uh, but, and a lot, I realize that a lot of the books are fabricated a little bit too. You know, you don't ever know how much of it is uh, actual. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. But it is a six month uh, training period that, and it's it's called a farm. It's in Williamsburg, Virginia. So, and, that, and it's no secret that that's where it's at. It's uh, it's publicly known and publicized in the okay. books. Yeah. Um, Mike uh, had gone to work with the CIA in the mid nineteen ninety nine, and uh, had been several deployments at different locations, and actually was had just gotten back from the Balkans on uh, like the day or two before 9-11. Uh, he had been deployed. As a matter of fact, he was gone for like, I'm thinking three to four months because his sister got married during the time that he was gone. And uh, I remember when she was making plans for the wedding, it was before he left. And he said, sis, I'm sorry, but you know, I've, I'm, I'm going to be leaving the country and I won't be here. You know, so and we did. She got married while he was gone, and he came back. And uh, if, I'm, if my memory's right, I'm thinking it was just a couple of days before the first day back to the office uh, there at uh, CIA headquarters was on 9/11. And uh, I remember that day that, uh, and, and everybody remembers that. I'm sure you know mm-hmm. where, what they were doing and that morning when they. Uh, Planes flew into the towers and into the Pentagon and into the uh, field there in Shanks, uh, Pennsylvania. But uh, I remember watching the, uh, the uh, news that morning as I was getting dressed to go to the uh, office to work. And uh, I saw the first airplane, you know, fly into the building. Uh, well, I didn't see it fly into it. I saw the aftermath, you know, and I was listening to the commentators yeah. and all of them was talking about it. It, must, it had to be in a small plane that just, you know, accidentally flew into the building and you know kept watching and then just like minutes later they actually showed the other one hit the building and at that time you know I think along not only me but a lot of other folks everybody else that was watching when they saw the second plane come in it wasn't a small plane and we realized that that you know hey this is this is an attack on the United States right and of course uh, I tried I started trying to call Mike then, but I knew that I knew that was going to be his first day back, and I knew that that we couldn't contact him inside the uh, office, and because uh, he, he, you know, he couldn't take his cell phone in, and I didn't have numbers to talk to him inside. But it, I kept calling his cell phone, and uh, then that night, about nine or ten o'clock, he called me back and uh, explained to me, you know, what they had done that day, evacuating the buildings, and he and his team. Uh, were still had stayed there throughout the day because they thought the CIA office was going to be the CIA building was going to be a, a target also. Yeah. And uh, I remember asking him that night. I said, "Mike, uh, who who's responsible for this?" And he said, "Dad, you know who's responsible for this." So I've been a lot of this. And he said, "There's no doubt about that." And you know, I've told a lot of uh, folks that um, you know when when a lot of people sat around and when they're visiting, you know, at the dinner table or wherever, uh, in the bins watching TV, uh, probably Osama bin Laden's name never came up. And 99.90% of the, uh, 99% of the, uh, people's conversations. But Mike and I had talked about Osama bin Laden for probably six or seven or eight years. Wow. Yes. And you know, that's crazy and, because uh, I was, I was, I think, 24 years old or 25, I was 24 when it happened. And um, I'd never heard of Osama bin Laden, which is it's just a shame, yeah. even though I remember the coal being, USS Cole being bombed. And But that yeah. day of 9-11, I was sitting around with a couple other people, and one guy had mentioned Osama bin Laden, like, hey, it's got to be him. And I remember feeling, you know, I felt, you know, odd or I felt bad because I didn't know who that was. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, we didn't have the news media. Didn't it was it was made public, but it wasn't made public like you know. We have to have things told to us several times a day. You know, it's, it's got to be pretty much 
because we're a pretty complacent people. The American people are. Mm-hmm. We've become that way over several years. But uh, Mike being in the Marine Corps and the first uh, World Trade Center, you know, bombing was 1992 or 93. And uh, then we had the other, uh, uh, you know, strikes by Osama bin Laden against our military yeah. in different locations around the world from then on for several years. And then the main thing that sticks out in my mind is, and if I'm thinking right about this, 1995, when Osama bin Laden publicly on television and then it was shown on TV where he declared war against the United States of America, against Americans yeah, and urged, and urged people like him to kill Americans. And, uh, you know, the thing about it is, uh, uh, and I've said this many times and I stand by it today. 9-11 did not have to happen. Uh, if we had a had, and I'm not trying to make this a political uh, conversation or anything like that, but the facts are facts. If we'd have had somebody, an administration in place that would have done what they should have done when we knew for sure yep, that yep. Osama bin Laden was killing Americans. Yeah, many years and prior. And then we, yeah. we, many years prior. And then over that period of time, we had six to seven times. I think it's documented seven times, and there was probably more times than that, but I think it's seven documented times that he was in our sights. We could either snatch him or we could kill him, either one. And when we've got a guy that's killing Americans, that's enough reason to kill him. That's enough reasons to snatch him. That's that's enough reasons to bring him back to the United States. And if we'd have had somebody doing what they should have been doing, and protecting the American people, which is the number one job of our president, uh, 9-11 would have never happened because if that, after, after he did this from 19, well, he started back in like, I guess, uh, before that, his actual start, he started killing people in 19, in 1990s and, uh, openly attacking the, uh, our Marines and other people around the world. And I blame that on them. And I've, I've said this to, I said, I've sent in some of the senators' offices and said it to them that uh, if you rent office and you weren't jumping up and down on the steps of the Capitol and the White House saying, we've got to do something, this guy's killing Americans, then you got to take some responsibility yourself too. Good for you. Because if you're in office, if you're in your office, if you're in office at that time, you know, then then you should have been standing up saying, "Hey, we got to protect the American people. We got to do something." But you know, and this is getting, I know, to be sort of a political type thing here. But just think about what went on during the Clinton years, uh, and we got to blame the Republicans too, because Republicans were so hell bent on doing things that. Uh, trying to catch Bill Clinton with his lover in the office or prove that he had a lover in the office or whatever. Yeah, yeah I definitely blame both sides. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, we, we, we should have been looking at what, what is the, what are we should, what we should we be doing? What are the things that we need to be really worried about? I'm not saying we shouldn't have worried about that at all, but that wasn't priorities. Priorities was our young men getting killed around the world by Osama bin Laden and Al Qaeda. And uh, so anyway, that's probably enough of that. I, I, I pretty much told you where I stand on, yep, on yep. that uh, point there. Uh, so he, got, he gets ready me, to deploy. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. He, he told me that uh, uh, that night, I, one of the questions I asked him, I said, well, what do you think the next step's going to be? He said, I don't know. Uh, you know, I just I don't have any idea. And, and, and it sort of came without saying that if he had known, he couldn't tell me. You know, it was... But, you know, we, I guess he t- probably told me as much as he could. And, uh, and, but since then, I've been told by other people uh, at the agency and uh, actually the group leader, the guy that was in charge of the uh, A team, the team he was on, uh, sort of step by step exactly what happened, you know, when they decided that they would, uh, that they'd be going in. And 
you know, there's a book out there, The Art of Intelligence. It's, him, it's written by Henry Crumpton. Uh, we called him Hank. I, I didn't know that he was actually in charge of, had been put in charge of it, but he was. But that young man was pretty remarkable. Uh, and the way that, and I may be saying things that's already been said, and people may already know this, but uh, George Tennant uh, went to uh, President Bush and convinced President Bush to, I guess, convince him they talked or whatever, and President Bush put the CIA in charge of the, and I'll call it invasion into Afghanistan, or re- retaliation into Afghanistan against Osama bin Laden. And that's the first time, and if you read the uh, book, The Art of Intelligence, you'll get some real interesting things there that I guess the average person, you know, does not know. That when, first time, I, the, the CIA, when Mike was in the Marine Corps, I always, you know, had the thing in my mind, the Marines are always the first in. That's just what, you know, you always thought. But, you know, the thing I realized, and I had one of the senators to call me while I was in D.C., uh, after, right after we buried Mike, and he called, and his secretary did, and wanted me to come to his office to visit with him. And he was from one of the other states. He wasn't from here, but this particular senator had actually been a CIA officer. And uh, he just wanted to talk to me and said he thought he could help me maybe understand exactly uh, what Mike's job was and what he did and those kind of things. And how that he told me how he was uh, in the Vietnam era, he was behind the scenes as a CIA agent in uh, Vietnam. And that's the first time he, he made me realize that. And I didn't understand that until then that, the Marines aren't the first people in. You got to have the intelligence. So we, those guys that, you know, go in civilian clothes and drop in behind in with parachutes or come in under a fictitious name and they work in a country for three or four or five months, maybe even years before something happens. And they're the first ones on the ground. They're the guys that's risking their lives. And, uh, that's what actually happened in Afghanistan. It wasn't that we just then went. We had already been to Afghanistan. Our CIA uh, guys had already been in there several times. But the plan was that uh, the CIA would lead it. And we weren't going in, the CIA, just to fight the fight. We were going to be going in to link up with the warlords the Northern Alliance and help them assist them uh, with airstrikes, with intelligence, do the things that we had to do, show them how to fight the war or whatever, and but fight with them, you know, go go with them. And so that's so, exactly so what was Johnny, done. do you know what uh, was this? Did they first get there in October or were they actually there in September? Our, our guys, the CIA and you know, whoever else. Would we 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 had some guys in the the way I the way I understand the way I've been told. We had some guys that were actually in the friendly areas, the tribal areas. That was uh, uh, we had some people already on the ground there, but it wasn't like they were just there to try to. Uh, I guess uh, I need to say gather intelligence. Uh, do the preliminary stuff. When the when the when we went into Afghanistan, we went in teams. And this is an interesting uh, thing that uh, Mike's leader, his group leader, uh, told me that when he when Mike came to him, he he just got back from the Balkans, is where he was at, and so he came to, uh, and I don't know that I ought to say his name, but so I'm just going to call him the leader. And stuck his head in the door and told him, said, look, said, I know we're going to be going. Just be sure. I know I've been gone for three or four months, but be sure I'm part of it. And, uh, you know, that's just how adamant Mike was about being part of the part of it. Mm-hmm. And he said then when uh, they got the word back that Tennant had uh, met with Bush and that they had decided what they were going to do and how they were going to do it, and they had Actually, Hank Crumpton, if you read his book, Henry Crumpton, he was in Africa, and they called him back into the United States and put him in charge of it. And the strange thing about that was that 
Henry Crumpton had never been in the military, but he had been in the CIA for some years. He uh, was actually raised over in Georgia. And, but his knowledge and whatever, he was, I guess, qualified to uh, organize and do the things that they needed to do. It wasn't just a military action. It was we were going to send people in to, we were going to send groups in that would link up with the Afghan uh, locals, the Northern Alliance, and help them obtain our objective, find bin Laden, and uh, fight al-Qaeda, and fight the Taliban. We didn't go to Afghanistan. This is one thing I think a lot of people don't understand. We didn't go to Afghanistan just to fight the Taliban. We went to Afghanistan because the northern, uh, the, because the al-Qaeda, Osama bin Laden's group, al-Qaeda, every one of those guys that uh, was in those airplanes were al-Qaeda fighters. They weren't Taliban. And that's it's very distinctive. Uh, Al-Qaeda fighters are foreign fighters. They're not locals. They're not local Afghans. And you can't, you know, you, it's like when John Walker Lynn went to Afghanistan and wanted to join the Taliban, they said, no, you can't do that because you, we can't take, we're not going to take you in because you're not, you're not an Afghan. But you can go join the Al-Qaeda groups. You can go to Osama bin Laden's training camps and join the Al-Qaeda. And that's one of the biggest uh, mistakes that people make and reporters make, and I've told several reporters this. Y- y'all don't know what you're talking about when you call John Walker Lynn a-, a Taliban because he's not. He was Al Qaeda. He was actually training in in the camps, uh, the Al Qaeda camps, Osama bin Laden's camps, with the people that came to the United States and hijacked the airplanes and flew them into our buildings and killed our people. That was Al Qaeda. The Taliban were protecting them. They were allowing them to train in Afghanistan. And don't get me wrong, the Taliban are bad people. Before this all happened, I mean, we were all watching. If you watch TV daily on the nightly news, you would just about every day, they'd have some shots of uh, Taliban bringing somebody out into a courtyard, into a street, putting them on their knees in front of them and shooting them through the head. You'd see the dirt fly behind when the bullet went through the head and hit the dirt. I mean, they were bad people. Yeah. Oh yeah. But they were not the people that attacked the United States. They, they harbored bin Laden and his Al Qaeda and allowed them to do it. And George Bush, president Bush stood on the uh, grounds at ground zero and told them, told the world, if you don't help us, then you're going to be against us. Yep. And if you help Al Qaeda, we're going to come get you too. And so we had no choice but to go after uh, Al Qaeda and Bin Laden because we knew they knew right off the bat it was, it was his group that did it. Um, what happened uh, when they uh, they decided, you know, that they were going to send their groups in? Uh, I was told by this guy who was at the horse soldiers uh, statue uh, dedication uh, four or five months ago. Uh-huh. I, you probably know about that. Oh, yeah. And uh, one of the guys was, was telling me, actually the leader of the group, and we, we were together and just spending some time, and he said, Mr. Van, I've never told you this, but said, I don't think I have. And he, he asked me if I did. I said, no, he's never told me about, you know, what actually happened when y'all split up. And he said that when he got he got called in, and when his his orders were that he was going to be like the uh, the fifth group. Uh, they they were putting them eight man uh, teams, and uh, his team was going to be like the fifth one. And said when he came back to his uh, section there and told the guys, he said that Mike just had a fit. He said I don't I can't believe. Why, why are y'all, why are we going to be last? We need to be the first group in. And, uh, he said that Mike stayed on him every day and said he, he told his superiors, you know, that, uh, he was getting some flack from his people that, you know, they didn't want to be the last ones in. They wanted to be the first ones in. So when they actually went into Afghanistan, the way he explained it to me was he said, I got the call and one of our team members, uh, one of our guys that was, over the whole thing, uh, not over the whole thing, 
but over the section, I guess, was actually already in Uzbekistan and said he called me and said, how soon can your people be ready? And he said, we already had everything ready. We had everything ready to go. So we had it lined up along the walls at our little cubby holes. And he said, I, we're ready to go now. He said, okay, you're going to be alpha team. You're going to be the first team. So Mike's yeah. the team that Mike was on was the first team to drop into hostile territory. And, and so I don't want you to think they were the first ones to plant feet in Afghanistan then, even though they had already been in Afghanistan. But when the invasion started, uh, we had some people in the friendly territories, but Alpha team was the first one that dropped in about 70 miles south of Mazar Sharif in the, uh, uh, in the valley down there. And their goal when they dropped in in the middle of the night, uh, was to link up with General Dostum, the warlord in that area there, and uh, start that, assembling his men. At that time, did they, did Americans trust General Dostum? Uh, I think Mike and his, the guys on his team and the SF team that they were, that came in, uh, I think they did. Uh, I think they won his trust, and he and he he won their trust. I think it was a mutual thing. Uh, after talking to General Dostum and being in his presence and being with the people, some of his people, and listening to things that they said and the things they did, I think they did trust each other. But to start with, I don't think they did, because at one point, and I think it's been written about in some of the books, and I was told that their orders were that. General Dostum's a pretty ruthless type of guy. His his the history of things he had done was when he was you know that's all he'd ever done was fight. Oh yeah. And uh, he had uh, he was accused of uh, suffocating you know some people putting them in a van and closing them up and just leaving them and then various things. And there was tales told about him tying some of his people to the tank, uh, like they disobeyed him you know and stuff like that. He's just a ruthless guy, but. He was the kind of guy, he was a leader and he got things done. And you're, you're in a third world country that, you know, I guess somebody has to be heavy handed, you know? Uh, but anyway, the, the, the way I was told was Mike's team, Mike left the United States on, uh, December the, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, on October the uh, 8th. Uh, I'm thinking I'm right about that. That's either, that should be a Saturday. If I look back on my calendar, but uh, just a day or two around that, he, the way it happened was he called me. Uh, I'd made him promise me that if he was going to be going, that he'd let me know. And he called me like on a Wednesday night, and he said, uh, Dad, we're going to be leaving. And uh, I said, when? And he said, the plans are that I'll leave next Monday. I said, okay, uh, I'll come up this weekend and visit with you. And, uh, my daughters were, you know, every, every, was all going to fly in and to uh, Dulles there and, uh, go visit with Mike. And I got a call from him on Thursday and I, I went ahead and made my airline reservations that night and then got a call on Thursday the next day. And he said, uh, that's been moved up. And, uh, I said, well, Michael, I've already got my, my airline tickets, uh, and Tanya and Tammy has too, and we're going to be flying in Friday uh, afternoon. We're supposed to get to Dulles at five o'clock. And uh, I said, just you know, we'll we'll get a rental car and you know come to your house. And so then uh, I say this this is on Thursday. Then Friday morning, he called me back and said, uh, Dad just moved it up again. Said I'm going to be leaving out Saturday Saturday morning. And I said, well, Mike, we're, we're heading to the airport this afternoon. We're leaving. We're going to be there at 5 o'clock, stay with the family. We'll get rental cars, and we'll meet you at your house. We were standing. My, my daughter's was getting the luggage off the uh, luggage uh, racks uh, in the uh, uh, arrivals, you know, down to the baggage I'm forgetting claim. about what it's called. Baggage claim, yes. <laughs> I don't know why my, my mind went blank. 
and I had uh, took the thing over to uh, the rental car at the Hertz. I was at Hertz rental car thing, and I was standing in line. And he calls me again, and he said, uh, "Dad, uh, I just got a call, and they're waiting on me now. I've got to go." And I said, "Mike, we're at the airport. Can you?" I said, where, "Where are you at now?" He said, "We're in a car. We're, the uh, Shannon and the kids are with me, and they're taking me to drop me off." And I said, well, can you pull over somewhere? Can you come through by here or something so we can see you before you leave? He said, Dad, they're waiting on me. I, I, I've got to go. And so, of course, we said our goodbyes over yeah. the telephone. And then uh, I remember uh, we stayed up there that weekend, and I'm thinking on Sunday mornings when they actually started dropping the first uh, uh, ordinances in on the ground, you know, the bombs. But they they uh, they linked up up in Uzbekistan, where they all linked up, and there was a twelve man special forces team. Each each eight man CIA team had a twelve man special forces team. Uh, you know, to go in, they were going in together. But the funny thing that happened there, and I, I sat and talked with all these guys, the the guys on the special forces team. Uh, I love them. Uh, I think a lot of them. Uh, Every time they've had any kind of a function, they always call me and invite me to their things. And, you know, uh, there's a, a real bond there. That And so I'm not saying anything at all and don't have anything bad to say about them. They were a band of brothers, all of them together, them and the CIA team. And I guess you had to be when you dropped into the middle of the, the desert in the middle of the night and uh, a helicopter, uh, you know, and you dropped off. Two thirty, three 3 o'clock in the morning and you're left out there by yourself, uh, I guess you have to be. Oh, yeah. But the bad thing about that was they, the, see, the Special Forces team was supposed to go in with them, two different helicopters. But Mike's team, uh, when I say Mike's team, the team Mike was on, the Alpha team, uh, when they flew out and flew over the Hindu Kush mountains there, the Special Forces team didn't fly. Uh, and what General Mulholland and everybody else says is that uh, that their helicopter, the weather was too bad, the whatever, and they couldn't fly over the mountains. So the CIA team stayed inside in uh, south of Mazar Sharif there on the ground for three days before the special forces team came in. And were these the SF guys coming in on horseback or is it a different group? No, no, no. They were all, they were all flown in by helicopters. Okay. They where the horse soldier thing comes in is, uh, general Dostum, when they linked up with Dostum, Dostum, uh, Dostum was at the point of being annihilated. He was, he was, and, and he, the first night I was in Afghanistan when we sat at the table and I asked him questions and talked to him. He asked me if there was anything that he could tell me or anything I wanted to know from him. And I talked to him and asked a lot of questions. Of course, he didn't speak English, so he, his interpreter uh, was the interpreter for us. And I, one of the questions I asked him was, I said, uh, how do you feel about the Americans coming to Afghanistan? And he sat there for just a period of time, and he was pretty much of an extrovert with his hands. He used his hands when he's talking a lot. And his answer was to imagine yourself on a hilltop, and you're surrounded by your enemy. And you know that you've only got a limited amount of time to live. Your days are few. And you've already gone to the point that everybody has made the decision of who is going to shoot who and who's going to be the last one left to kill themselves to keep from being captured by your enemy. And he said, then the Americans come and he just raised, he held his hands out and just raised his hands up and, and said, they took me out of that situation. And he, he looked at me and he said, what else can I say? Wow. And uh, so he was, 
and he was a believable guy. Now I, 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 you know, I believe the guy was, uh, he was sincere, uh, about that. Uh, the, uh, fact that the special forces didn't fly in the, the, the team members, uh, were pretty, uh, uh, angry about that. They, uh, the, I was told that the decision was made in Tampa, uh, and I don't know if that part's true or not, you know, and they probably didn't know, but they said they made three attempts that the pilots would turn and go back. But the CIA copter, it flew straight in and, and dropped in on target. And then three days later, the special forces team came in. Uh, there was some speculation that the CIA knew they had been in Afghanistan, but these other guys hadn't. They didn't know what they were going to run into, I guess. Uh, and there was a lot of, when you read the book, uh, The Art of Intelligence, you'll see that uh, Henry Crompton pretty much says in there that there was a lot of animosity, I guess you'd call it, uh, from Rumsfeld and some of the higher-ups in the military because they didn't want the CIA to be leading this field. They wanted to go in old style and you know do the invasion like they would have normally have done. When when the CIA and the Special Forces linked up with General Dostum, General Dostum assembled his uh, Northern Alliance fighters and uh, horsemen, he called them, and said there was, and, and I'm sure there wasn't exactly 2,000, but the number was always used, and that's what Dostum said, 2,000 uh, horse soldiers. And at that point, the only way that the uh, CIA and the Special Forces team could go up the valley to uh, Mazari Sharif to liberate Mazari Sharif was on horseback. They didn't have anything else at that time, so that they were forced to ride horses mm -hmm. and and fight and fight that fight on horseback. And I've heard some of the other commentary where some of these other guys, you know, and I'm not belittling anything. The the things that I'm saying is things that I've been told by General Dostum, uh, by his people. Uh, Zachy, his interpreter, his other people that was, you know, in his command over there, and the members of the special forces group, the 12 man forces, special forces, and the eight man CIA team, or the seven that was left. Uh, that's where all my information comes from as far as what actually happened in Afghanistan. And, uh, the, and from that point, there started being other teams, uh, is yeah. what I've been told, come in. Yeah, and, and Johnny, my, you may want to listen think, to uh, episode number number eight of my podcast because that's where I talked to Bart uh -huh. Decker, who is uh, one of the yeah, I've, I've listened. Yeah, okay. I've listened to Bart, and and they uh, they did. I, I think they were in. Um, I don't think they dropped. I, well, I know they didn't drop in. I think I know they didn't drop in at the same location south of Mazar sharif uh, I think they dropped in a little bit farther east. And I don't, from my understanding, their team was an alpha team. The alpha team, the CIA uh, alpha team, A team, was the first group in, and the uh, ODA 595 was the first special forces team in. And according to the people at the Horse Soldiers Statue of Dedication, General Mulholland and the other folks that were there uh, verified the different, you know, the things that I'm I'm saying the same things that they said. Or they verified what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they were, and and, he, and they were, they were all riding horses at some point. Uh, and, and as they came in, that's the only way they had uh, when they dropped in. And I'm not for sure. I don't. I think, and I haven't. I can't remember if his uh, podcast said which one of the warlords that he was actually riding with. Uh, uh, I don't remember. I think, it might, I, think it, I think it might have been Otta. I'm not sure. I can't remember now. But Dostum was the one that uh, that Mike's team, Mike and his team, and the, 
or five nine five O D A five nine five. That's the one that they linked up with and well, went up um, to Missouri. Yeah, I know that Missouri Mark Street. Decker Decker and his group were looking for were linking up with uh Dostum. Mm-hmm. I think they did when they were on their way to Missouri Sharif, somewhere along the way. I think they're always combining. But I, I'm, you know, I wasn't there, so I don't know. I just know that what Mulholland and what the CIA guys and what uh, the team leaders uh, told me about that, that they were the A team and the 595 and that they dropped in uh, and linked up with Dosum. And according to what Dostum told me, that he, he it was sort of funny the way he talked. We talked at length about uh, one of the S, SF guys, uh, Mark, and I don't know if I should call his. It was Mark Newitz. I don't think it mattered to call his last name. Mark Newitz was the uh, leader of the SF team. And at that time, when I met Mark in uh, 2002, he was – a pretty small guy then, I thought, you know, sort of slim and trim and stuff. But he's, he's done a lot of growing there over the last 10 years. <laughs> but uh, uh, General Dostum, they laughed about it and would talk about how that when the, he thought he had, you know, some men coming to have him, you know, to link up with him. To, and he said, here come these bunch of skinny guys with 100-pound rut backs, rut packs on their back. And he said... It, it, you know, he was wondering how they was carrying the bags, much less how are they going to help him fight, you know. <laughs> but they got his attention pretty fast uh, by uh, calling in some airstrikes and showing them what they could do. And uh, I think uh, and Mark and them told me about that they were, had, when they were trying to convince them and roast them of what they could do and I guess trying to gain his confidence that uh and and I'm trying to paint a picture now that I can sort of relate to and that you can too and anybody else that's listening to me. They said he was standing on like imagine you're on like a, a hill or something, you know, a mountain and said they were looking over at another place where they had uh uh I guess they knew that there was some, some Taliban uh and Al Qaeda uh camps over there. And said he called in, he told General Dosum you know, told his interpreters, said, Watch the hilltop. And I'm imagining that hilltop was probably a mile away, two miles away, I guess. And I'm not sure about that, but I know it was a good ways. And he, they told him to watch it. And he called and said, they, you know, he could hear the, the airplane uh, coming in and said, those of you know, was looking up in the sky, you know, and like everybody could hear it, but they couldn't see it at that point. And said, uh, they kept telling him, you know, to watch the hill and said in a minute, the hill just blew up. You know, fire just went everywhere and dirt and stuff. And so then, like about several seconds after that, that's when they heard the blast, you know, and it just like rattled their ears. And so Dostum looked at him and said, show me again, do it again. <laughs> <laughs> and they said that at that point, you know, that they began to gain his confidence, that, that he, he knew what they could do and what they was able to do with, you know, calling an airstrikes to soften the target up. And uh, it's amazing to me to sit to listen to some of those guys uh, talk about uh, Dostum and his men fighting on horseback and how that he, they, they re, would compare it to like watching a TV show and seeing the cavalry. Uh, and they said Dostum was never in the back. The Dostum was saying, you know, waiting for his men to follow him and uh, that he was riding right in the front of them. Well, I, I guess and, that's the sign of a true leader right there. Sounds yeah. like. Uh, and, of course, you know, riding into the fire of AK-47s and mortars and everything else and horses falling and men falling off. And but he said, and, and one of the things that, that was sort of, I've been around horses. I had horses when I was younger. And, you know, horses are usually pretty easy to spook if you try to shoot off of them or something like that. But, and this is what one of the guys told me, said, you know, if you can imagine, these horses are, were, they've fought so much. They've been on, had fighters on top of their, on their backs so many times, firing shots, that they're riding full speed, firing an AK-47, and the horses just, in a straight line, just keep, you know, keep getting it 
you know. And uh, I've never had a horse that would uh, that you could do that with. <laughs> yeah, but, they, they uh, were used to all that loud noise, I guess. Yeah. But anyway, that that was my knowledge of, you know, how it all happened. And all those guys uh, came together. And, of course, you know the story about when they uh, went through College Angie. And the last time I talked to Mike, he was actually, they were moving their stuff out of College Angie, the fortress there, over to the Turkey Schoolhouse. Uh, and it was on Thanksgiving Day. And uh, that's actually the first time that I got to talk to him uh after he had been in Af- inside Afghanistan, and he called to check on his kids that day, and uh, he, uh, the words he didn't say a lot to me, but we, we, just very few words. And that, what I remember him saying was, uh, "Have you been seeing the news where we liberated Mazar Sharif?" And I said, "Yes, I did." Uh, did you know we're taking a lot of prisoners at Conduce? Yeah, I saw that in the news too, and. Uh, his, his uh, you know, the his first wife, the girl's mother, was actually dying of cancer, and uh, his comments was to me that you know he was so sorry that he was over there and knowing that we was having to take care of the kids and stuff like that, and uh, that uh, he really needed to stay uh, several more days, maybe a week or two. Uh, but after that, after they got the prisoners uh, from Conduce, uh where they could, you know, try to debrief them, get the information off of them, he really felt like, I think he told me that day, he felt like that they were going to be able to get a lot of good information and, and get Bin Laden, find out where Bin Laden was at, uh, and get information that would lead them to Bin Laden. And he said, uh, just when I, I, I've, I've got to go down uh, Sunday, and I didn't know where go down or whatever that meant. You know, I just knew that on Sunday he was going to be meeting some group of prisoners to try to interrogate them or try to get information. 